Welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, created and hosted by Scott Knudsen, to explore the crossroads of horses and the business world. On today's show, Scott visits with Eric Hoffman, the Director of Horsemanship Education at Montana Center for Horsemanship. Now here's your host, Scott Knudsen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. Whether you're listening to us on the radio, on KCAA, the NBC affiliate out in California, or watching our podcast on many of the different platforms, we want to welcome you. We have a great guest today. Eric Hoffman is here. Eric is the Director of Horsemanship Education for the Montana Center of Horsemanship in conjunction with the University of Montana Western. Eric, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Scott. So so we met up in Dillon, Montana at, at the, the conference, and it was Horse, Human, and, and Nature Conference, um, and it was such a great time. So thank you so much for having us up there, and, and uh, I've told so many people about how great everybody was, for sure. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was definitely an eye-opening experience. You know, we're a little town in southwest corner of Montana, and how we had people from all over the world show up just for those three days. It, it, it really enlightened everybody around there and heard a lot of good feedback for being the first conference. It, it was amazing, you know, that everybody was so nice and so professional, but the education part was just amazing. You know, it was horse education. It was it was uh, human horse interaction. And you also had an international movie fe- uh, event going on as well. So there was a lot going on in those three days. Yeah, it you know, we didn't know really what what we were expecting. I mean, we had a goal for the first one, but, you know, it really I, get, I think we all left there with a different thought or mindset going into it and how it just it, it exploded i mean having that international film festival and just people from all over the world not you know not just montana or united states um it just it makes the the equine industry you realize how how big of a thing that is in in the world and how horses influence everybody absolutely it was, it was a special time for sure and to see some of the kids that go to the university too man they were they were involved you know and that that was really special to see um, so, so let's talk about you. So did you grow up with horses? I guess that's the first question or around <laughs> horses. I did not. I grew up on a small dairy farm in South central Minnesota. We farmed about 500 acres. My dad still does. Um, we milked about 40 cows, kind of the old fashioned way in the stanchions. Oh, wow. There's three of us boys and my mom and dad. And it was, it was a lot of work as a kid. Um, all three of us boys, you know, I think we all wanted to get off the dairy at some point in our, our childhood there. Um, but looking back on it, it, it was a great experience as far as teaching work ethic and all that. Um, you know, cause it, anybody that's been around dairies, it's, it's probably worse than ranching. It's seven days a week and time schedule, quite a bit of time scheduling. So, so is it, is it twice a day? Is it three times a day? You know, I, I've never grew up on a dairy ranch. I never worked one. But I heard it was really it, early, really late. Yeah, it's t- twice a day. Dad would start milking. I think he'd get up at four thirty, and then we'd, you know, we'd help feed and all that before we get on the school bus at seven. And we get to school, and we come back at about oh four o'clock and feed again. Then we'd in, in that country we'd eat dinner at uh, I guess we call it supper back in those days at four thirty, and then we'd start milking again at five and get down about seven, and then could do your schoolwork and. So it, it, it kept us, I mean, looking back, it kept us out of trouble. So, I mean, it, it carried those, those values probably carried us all three of our boys, you know, later in life to have success and all that and appreciate hard working, hard working lifestyles. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, it makes a difference what you do and, and those dairy farmers, man. I don't think that they're, they're underappreciated for sure. Um, but that way of lifestyle, you know, it's, it's tough. Like you say, especially being in Minnesota. You know, I mean, it's it's not exactly warm there. No, not at all. <laughs> um, at least, at least in, or I remember snow drifts as tall as buildings and all that. And they don't have oh, that wow. type of snow anymore. But, oh, yeah, it was, I mean, it was one of the roughest places for winter, I think, I've been. Um, you know, where I live now, it's, it's not too bad. Um, but, no, it was good. I mean... You, you know, I always had a passion for horses. I remember the, the movie that got me into it. Everybody talks about the Black Stallion, and I, I enjoyed that movie. But the one that got me is I wanted to be Jim Craig uh, for Man from Snowy River. That yes. one really hit me. Um, so, and then, you know, my parents are John Wayne fans, so I watched a lot of Westerns and just kind of, 
enjoyed that Western lifestyle. And, you know, as a kid, we, you know, being at the dairy, we <laughs> never went on vacation very much. If it sure. was, it was maybe a day. So I never got out West to see that stuff, but it always held true to my heart, I guess, for, you know, as the Western style of life and the horse deal. And, um, I begged and begged to get a horse when I was young and just, you know, it just never fit played in the cards when I was younger. And then I think I was about 15. My, my dad finally caved on me and, uh, I don't have a lot of horse people background in my family. My, you know, both grandparents worked horses for a living for farming and all that. So they looked at them more as a, a tool. It wasn't a recreation like it is now. Mm -hmm. Um, but my dad always had a soft heart for horses and all that. But when I was 15, he finally let me, let me get a horse. And I did the typical thing that I tell students not to do go buy a young horse and grow up with it and learn from it. Don't get a seasoned <laughs> oh, no. horse. Oh no. So, yeah, I bought a little little uh, Arabian Pinto uh, yearling, and thankfully it it, it worked out. Um, we got some few more horses before I left for college and all that. But looking back, it, it could have been a, a a big wreck. Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, I guess the best teacher is experience. <laughs> you experience yeah, yeah, exactly. you from a place right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness. So so what got you to Montana to Dillon, Montana? Was it the, the job or were you already out there? Um, well, I moved to Dillon three different times. I ended up going to school in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, right. I was riding bulls at the time and I wasn't very good, but I, I just enjoyed the people and the rodeo atmosphere and all that. And that's why I kind of moved out to Wyoming. That was my, my first day out there was first day of class. Never looked at the school or nothing. And so it, it was, it was a lifestyle change to say the least. And, and, uh, you know, they had a, a horse program there that I got into. And, and from there, I kind of went out on the West coast and worked for a horse clinician out there. He was kind of getting going at the time and he needed help and I needed a job. And I met him at a wedding, met him one, a couple of days. And then six months later, I just moved out there and, and, and helped him. I, you know, he was involved with the BLM Mustangs quite a bit. So we got a lot of experience working with Mustangs there and, been traveling around with him doing clinics helping him with that just riding a lot of horses um i was with him for two years and i know the first year we were there we figured we'd handled probably a little over 700 head of horses um so a as a kid coming out of college not knowing anything that was probably the best spot i could have went um i talk about that to my kids a lot you know i didn't know what i was doing a lot but he guided me a little bit and, and the horse is probably the biggest teacher, just getting the experience. Um, I wouldn't want to relive those days, but I wouldn't take that out of my past. Right. Um, but no, it, it was fun. It, it was, it was a lot of work. I think I was making 500 bucks a month living out of a, a horse trailer that wasn't livable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, I, you know, and then I made some connections after that, kind of did my own cold starting business in Minnesota during the summer months. And then I met a guy from Montana up in Bozeman that was doing a horse clinic in Iowa. And I really liked what he did. And I kind of got with him in the winter times and kind of just bounced back and forth for four or five years doing that type of thing. Um, and then I ended up going back to college to get my teaching degree in ag education out of Wyoming. And uh, then at that time, I kind of met my wife and moved up here. And well, I guess to go back in 02, I uh, ended up uh, through that guy I met in Bozeman. His dad was managing the ranch here uh, at LaSance here in Dillon and got me a calving job. So that's how I got the Dillon the first time and really liked the area. I was here in, just in, during the winter months. And, and uh, he ended up a couple of years later kind of doing the horse program down here at LaSance and and uh he hired me on here and kind of worked underneath him for a little bit and then i ended up getting married and kind of got the head job a couple years after that and so yeah i've moved here three different times so it's a good spot i think i'll i'll probably stay here the rest of my life so <laughs> yeah yeah that way you don't have to move back <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. scott will be right back with more from eric hoffman Hi, I'm Scott Knutson, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Today, we're going to talk about something I'm really passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. Those that don't, now you know I do. And we've been working on this for several months, and we, we wanted to get it just right. 
and we don't put our name on anything unless we feel 100% certain it's, it's the best product we can get. And uh, we, we've done it. I really believe we've done it. We've created a coffee line, 13 great flavors. I'm going to show you three of them. We have K-Cups in all 13 flavors. Here's a Jamaican Me Crazy. It's a, just a really great coffee. Everyone has great logos. It has a brand, the same brand that's on our horses, our trailers. You know that brand means something and we wouldn't put it on here if it wasn't good coffee. We have whole bean. This is a great Honduran blend and uh, it's a whole bean coffee. We have whole bean in all 13 flavors. And then we have a ground coffee. Uh, this is a really great one. My wife and I really like this a lot, loved it. So we named it after our daughter, Hades Glen. Everyone has the packaging and the logo of the show, our brand, and I hope you like it. I, I really believe you will. And we're gonna have more flavors coming out soon. We're gonna have the pumpkin spices and then we're gonna go to peppermint after that. And please send us your suggestions as well. You can find it at cowboyentrepreneur.shop. Think coffee shop, cowboyentrepreneur.shop. Thank you so much. So, so the kids, so let's talk about the kids because that's a passion of mine is the kids learning this industry and coming into the industry. When, when they're coming to you for the first time, are they mostly experienced riders or horse people or are they first timers? So it, it all ranges, Scott. I mean, we have typically we're about 100 to 110 kids in our, in our natural horsemanship program here. Um, and it's a bachelor's degree. We're the only one in the nation that offers a bachelor's in, in uh, NH. Um, and these kids come from all over the United States. I'd say a little over 70% are out of state students. Um, we've had them from Florida, Maine, Hawaii, Alaska, um, a couple from England. Um, you know, and they're, they're I guess their uh, experience levels all vary from kind of green or, you know, pretty green to maybe been riding horses since they were born. Um, so we kind of get it all. And, they, and the unique thing about our program, too, is they bring their horse to school. So they go through our horsemanship classes with their own personal horse. Unlike going to a school and they have, you know, their own school horses and all that to use. They, so these kids are very committed when they show up because they're traveling across the country. We have a trailer, long-term trailer park in here at the, at uh, MCH here. And it's always interesting seeing the rigs rolling in in August because I mean, they're coming across the country in rigs. Like I probably wouldn't leave the County in. <laughs> um, so that really shows their commitment. I mean, to me, they're more than just a college kid. You know, they're just not coming to school for a year or two or to try it out. It, it's a it's a commitment financially and just getting here. Um, so our retention rate in the program is pretty low, just I think for that fact. Um, but no, it, it's, you know, and the big thing with these kids, too, you know, the first years of class, you know, the first the freshman class, I guess we're uh, trying to get everybody on the same page. You know, we we teach about the LaSance method that the founder, William Kriegel, has kind of designed with with horsemen and all that. And it's a good step-by-step -step program to get everybody on, on the, on the, on the same page, you know, learning about horse maneuvers, how horses think we're really big about equine behavior, um, why horses act the way we want or the, the way they do, but we're also trying to accomplish jobs with it. We live in Dillon, Montana, where a lot of people make a living on horses. So they still have to perform for us. Um, and that can be kind of a, a difficult thing for some students, depending on where they come from. Um, but I think, you know, the kids that make it through the program, it, it's, uh, I was just talking about it today in our cult class. Um, we're not just teaching kids about horsemanship and horse behavior. We're, we're giving kids life skills, how to think, you know, problem solve, trial and error, you know, fail. I always tell my kids, usually first day of class and I get these weird looks saying, I promote failure. I want you to fail Absolutely. in this class. But I know you need a grade. But as far as the, the content, failing is fine. It's how you handle yourself in that situation. Absolutely. And I think that's the biggest things I, I see from and hear from our alumni of, you know, not every kid's going to go in the equine industry leaving here. Majority do. But if they go into a different type of field, they can figure it out and they're, they're teachable. Yeah. Um, especially in today's world where everything's on cell phones, uh, I don't even know their name. Siri can answer any question you ask. <laughs> That's what they say, but I don't know. 
<laughs> but she won't talk to me, so I don't know. <laughs> oh man! But you know the the, and I think that's and I think we talked about this at the conference too. That's the unique thing with the horse industry. That's not going to change. Horses aren't that way. You have to kind of think your way through that when you're working with horses. There's you know there's step by step programs that that are a good beginning guide. But then you have to look at experience and gaining that and being able to read them horses. And I think we do, you know, our program here does a pretty good job of teaching kids about behavior with horses and being able to read stuff before things happen or why they're not crossing the creek or going in the trailer versus just trying to push them in there. Um, you know, I always kind of figure there's two ways to look at horses. There's a mechanical way and there's a, a mental side of horses. And I think you need to understand both. But if you can combine both of those, I think you have a better relationship. And that's kind of what we, I guess that's what we're trying to push or known for in our program here. That's, that's so great. And, and what you said about the failure, I think it's the best teacher if you let it be for sure, because you won't remember, you'll remember that and you'll learn from it. And exactly. So, so how do you do that? Um, I know with a clinic, you know, you have different writing levels There might be 10 or 15 people, but when you have a classroom of some experienced people and some that maybe aren't, um, different areas of the country how do you put them all on the same page day one with the same outcome that's tough that's tough because because you're doing assessment for your classes at the end of the year and you have to hit class objectives every class and so you got the academia side of the world and that that can be difficult but i think the big thing is our classes are set up like clinics mm -hmm. um and it really like when we give uh tours or prospective students i always tell their parents the student success is depending on the student. We're here to help promote their growth and all that, but it's it's really in their hands of what they get out of the program. Um, so if you have a kid that comes in pretty high level, um, a lot of times those higher level kids are missing a lot of little things. They might ride really well, but then, you know, you, you get our ages, you get hurt, you got metal in your back and bones are you know aren't working the way it is you start looking at the little things a little more to help that so when you you know you can't rely on your riding ability your whole life um and that's one thing growing up too i think for myself that i i've really it's stuck with me my parents always talked about you know we were always taught let the adults talk as kids stay in the back and listen Absolutely. maybe not like that so much anymore but looking back, you know, people say, well, that's kind of mean. You want to involve kids. Yeah, but in one aspect, that taught us to listen to the adults. To this day, I rather, I rather talk to an 80-year-old man than some 18-year-old kid because that 80-year-old man has stories and experiences you can take from that. Right. Um, and to tell you the truth, Scott, too, at, at 18 years old, I was pretty scared of horses. Really? And, you know, um, I, I loved horses. And I still do enjoy them, have a passion for them. But I think that really helped me kind of search a little different way. I didn't want to be confrontational with a horse because I couldn't ride that good. Right. Um, so it made me kind of look at different aspects of doing, doing maybe it was a little more groundwork. Like I tell kids too, when I was their age, I was doing a lot of groundwork. There's a difference between uh, quantity versus quality. Now I maybe don't do as much groundwork, but the quality is better. That's awesome. And so these kids, going back to your, your statement or question, I guess, it, it's, it's very, it can be very individual, but it comes back to what that kid, how that kid wants to do it. If they ask a lot of questions, they're going to get a lot out of it. You know, they might have a task that they understand and accomplish, but then they should be asking, what more can I do with that, that exercise or that technique? Um, you know, and it's funny watching the growth. Like right now in the mornings, I have a, a, a second year class. So they're sophomores. They're just starting to think a little bit. Awesome. Um, and start asking questions. I had a third year class last block and those kids ask a lot of questions. So they're, you can tell their, their, their mental capacity changes. They're, they're being more aware of how that horse is operating underneath them. Their quality of questions are so much better. Um, so it, it's really neat seeing the growth of those kids. Oh, I bet it's amazing to see and, and you have such a big part in it. And as they're getting closer to their job or their career, getting out of school, um, I think that's just an amazing feeling to see someone on right. And right when they get good, they leave. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so the Lausanne Smith, so we've talked about it a couple of times. Do you mind going into that a little bit? Because I think it's really interesting. 
Yeah. So, you know, uh, William Craig will design that. He's got a school over in Paris, about 30 minutes of Paris. I, I was fortunately got to go over there and see that school. Very cool. um, kind of started over there. And then he bought a place over here in Dillon, I think in 2000. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a step-by-step -step method, um, groundwork and then some riding, but it really talks about, you know, reading a horse. Why does a horse function the way they do, you know, and it's a little bit different in, in Europe than here. Like a lot of, a lot of people, you know, probably a lot of viewers know, um, but we're trying to take that method over here to teach kids because our demographics of our kids have changed. You know, this is my 13th year teaching here. Um, not every kid is growing up with horses like myself. Um, this would have been a great tool for me at 15 years old yeah, versus trying to, trying to figure out with a horse and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but it also like, it goes back to teaching those kids how to think and read about them horses and why they're acting the way they're doing or, you know, what they're doing. Um, you know, and we get those those kids from France over here in the summertime to work with. They specifically come over here to work with young horses, halter breaking them and starting them. And they're very talented riders. You know, the students he has over there, they I mean, they do jumps. I wouldn't even think about going over with a horse. Um, very accomplished riders. But as far as, you know, they have the, the, the book knowledge and reading horses and all that. So when they come here with the young horse stuff, it, it kind of opens their eyes because they really have to use what they learned over there in front of them with a young horse. Right. Um, because the horses we get are, you know, they're not halter broke. They've usually been run off the mountain. Um, so you have a danger factor going. So really reading that, those kids get pretty sharp on that by the time, just in the three months that they're here. Um, and then they go back for, I think, nine more months to get certified from their program. And then they can go, they all pretty much end up in the equine industry over there doing all sorts of things. Wow, that's almost a two-year program coming over here in eight months and three months and eight months. So yeah, and I know, intense. you know, and I, I, you know, I stay in contact with some of those students, and then I saw a bunch of them when I was over there. I mean, this is this what they experienced here. They remember the rest of their lives. They they're always talking about it. So it, it's it, it was like us going over to France. I mean, I'll never forget that. I mean, I, as soon as I got back here, I'd like to go back again. I mean, it, it's a great place. It's just, to me, I, I never left the United States until then. And, you know, it's like, ah, oh, why do you want to go over there and all that? It opens up. You really don't realize how big the equine industry is in the world mm -hmm. um, and the different disciplines and techniques and theories. Um, it, it's, it really expanded my mindset because we go to Germany too. And, it, I love it. So any chances I can get to go see more, it's, yeah, I'm all about it. You know, always learn in this industry. That's what's so amazing. I mean, when I was up and dealing with you and I was listening to everyone else speak and watching the demos and even the movies, you know, I was learning, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I think that's the fun part about our industry. You never stop learning. Yeah. And those, those films are just amazing. I mean, talking about adversity. Yeah. Um, the world. I, I always tell kids, you think you got it bad. Somebody else has got it bad. And that really put life into perspective. And, and one thing I got, another thing I got, I was just the diversity, but the, the passion people have for horses, you know, that, that film from uh, Israel, that was just amazing. Yeah. Um, I would have, I, I would have quit and forget it. I'm not, I mean, you're dealing with, with conflict in the countries and just how she kept going with horses. It, it was, and, you know, and, and feeling that she needed to be there for those for those students to be a coach. It was amazing. That's so cool. And, and you're doing that and Dylan. I mean, you're there for the kids. I mean, and, and the kids are going to make a living because of what you and the university and, and, and the horsemanship program do for them. So it's, it's so important. So does the kids from, from Paris or Germany, do they get to work with the kids from here at the school, Any Do they cross paths because it's summertime? Oh, I don't. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Um, within our degree, we have different options. We have uh, management, psychology, science, and then equine instruction. And I'm hoping we're we're going to be able to try to involve some of those instruction kids. Well, now, Scott, I lied. You, you got me to lie now on video. We, we do. Because when I go to Germany through the German Quarter Horse Association, I take two of my students from the instruction option over there so they teach. So wow. they get the experience, the German side of things on that. Um, so we'd like to do more involvement. We do send some kids over to a school in Southern France, of course, before COVID. 
Um, and they go over there for a semester to teach at this accredited school. And these kids are three to 18 years old, but they have a hands-on horse program at that school too. Wow. So those kids get the, they really get, get thrown into the French culture, um, which is really neat. We, I think Amazing. I've sent about six or eight students over there already doing that. Incredible. Incredible. I bet they learn so much, not just the horsemanship skills, but the international skills. Oh, absolutely. I think if anything, I know when I take kids to Germany specifically, I mean, just the culture. Right. Um, you know, horses are, horse is a horse, of course, and we always yeah. say, but yeah. they get so much from the culture of it too. Um, and and the, the people we get in those camps in Germany, I mean, they just, they eat it up. Because I mean, they know we're coming from Dillon, Montana, so they, you know, they expect cowboys and absolutely. stuff like that like that but then they'll find out that we do a lot of similar things as far as horsemanship as they would in in an english discipline wow um i just so, had a student so this this morning she rides english and, and she, she's neat to talk to because she's like this stuff is helping my jumping horse you know getting them quieter and more respectful on the reins just you know pressure release stuff and i jumped on her horse today i haven't been in an english saddle in a, in a while it, it took me a while to get on but just the, the similarities, and I think that's the neat thing with our program. We're not just teaching a, a you know, Western discipline. It, it's horsemanship. It ties into whatever, whatever field you want to go into. Um, it, it's all the same. Yeah, it, it's so impressive that y'all did that. Y'all took that initiative to do a four-year natural horsemanship program and the Lausanne's method. Um, so, so when they go across um, to France or, or to Germany or when you do, uh, or when they come over here, it, what what breeds of horses are they riding over there? Is it quarter horses or is it a different breed? Um, the Germany deal is, it's a lot of quarter horses. Is it? Okay. Um, yeah, and we go to like a lot of the reining barns and all that, you know, Very a little cool. more Western background. Because um, it's through AQHA a little bit, but there's there's English. But like as far as the French students and where these kids go to uh, Southern France, I, there's that film, was it the Kamari horse? They talked about that yes. native France horse. Yes. Um, they're actually, that's where they're at. They oh, deal with wow. a lot of those horses. Yeah. That's really I know cool, they'll start, they'll start a few of those horses there. And so they always have good stories, but the French students, you know, they're, they're riding big warm bloods, um, you know, jumping horses, event horses and all stuff like that. So it, it's a little change when they come here for the quarter horse deal. But I, I bet it makes them a better rider, though, you know, just to come oh. over on something different and they go back and and uh, absolutely, sure. you know, um, that's so cool. So what about cold starting? Uh, I think you said you were doing some of that just a little bit ago. Yeah, we just got done. We just this is our first week. So we put on a cold sale this year. It'll be uh, April 1st and 2nd. Um, kind of a little unique thing, a little bit different than a lot of other colleges, but we get Colts that are typically older, two to three, maybe four. I think I even got a five-year-old this year. Really? We have, right now I got 22 Colts and 19 kids in that class. We get them donated from horse producers throughout the uh, Montana, Oregon, Wyoming, South Dakota. Um, we get them in, halt or break them, and we'll start, start them under saddle. These kids come out five days a week basically from now until the sale in April. Um, and I guess our end result is they'll do a competition that Friday. We'll kind of set up a ranch riding class for them to go through and compete. And uh, winners of that, that we usually do the top five. They're winning, you know, prizes, good quality tack, um, scholarship money, buckles. Um, it, it's a neat deal. And we get judges to come in for it. Um, and then the next day we sell it for, uh, you know, cost of the class, of course, and then scholarship money on top of that. Um, it, this is our, I think, 12th year doing this class and then our 11th year doing, or no, sixth year doing the sale here at, at, at Montana Center for Horsemanship. It's, it's a neat, neat program because those kids come out every day. Wow. Um, I, I try to treat that class like a everyday job. You know, they got to be responsible for it. And it doesn't fit every student we have time schedule with their classes or just, you know, they they just don't have the time commitment, but kind of going back to how these kids change, these kids change so much from September to April, just how tight knit they get because they're out here five days a week relying on each other um the neat thing too we take them up in the mountains through the winter time anybody that's been in dillon it, it's it's it, we have a neat spot to go on the ranch there 
I mean, they're crossing creeks, going up snow banks, you know, slick roads through the trees, wildlife. Um, it, it's a neat experience because a lot of those kids have never even been out of the arena with horses. Wow. <laughs> Took the blinders off for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and these horses where we get these horses from, um, they grew, they grow up in it. So it's, it's kind of neat seeing these colts. They might only have 10 rides on them. We'll throw them in a trailer and go up in the mountains and those colts will take care of those kids. That's so they're, cool. they're used to that environment. That's so cool. I bet when they come back, those kids really appreciate those horses a little bit different. You know, they got a little bit different bond after that ride. Yeah. They do. And, and there's, I'm not gonna lie. It's cold starting. So there's, there's some rough days. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> but you know, that next day is going to be better, you know? And, and uh, so, so does one, one kid have one horse specific or do they all take care of the group? Well, right now I, I'm still waiting on, I think four more horses coming in. So they'll rotate around. Um, it kind of just works itself out. And then usually semester break, I'll kind of maybe switch some horses around. Um, like I tell the students, the first semester is more for the kids learning and all that. And then second semester, we're trying to make a product for the public. Very cool. Um, so if we got to kind of switch some kids around to fit a horse a little bit different, we'll do that. Um, some kids might not come back the second semester just because it's, it's a little, you know, maybe they're not quite ready for it. Then maybe they work on things and then try it again the following year. But I think half my class are returning kids from last year. Wow. So it, it's a pretty rewarding class for those, you know, because to me, I, you know, it would have been perfect for me when I went to school, but it, it's a big time commitment. So I'm always surprised how many kids take it two or three times. I even have one student now he's in his third year and he wants to be the first student to do it all four years. Very cool. Good for him. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for listening to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Scott will be right back with Eric Hoffman. For more information on Scott Knudsen, the Cowboy Entrepreneur, visit us online at cowboyentrepreneur.com. Hi, I'm Scott Knudsen, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, heard on KCAA Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific. I'd like to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. In the morning, afternoon, and even late in the evening, I enjoy a good cup of coffee almost any time of the day. Now, my team at the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show has been working for several months on creating and introducing our own brand of coffee. We wanted to make sure that we got it just right. We don't want to put our name on anything unless we're 100% certain that it's the best product available, and we've finally done it. We have created a wonderful line of coffees, 13 fantastic flavors offered in whole bean, ground, and K-cups, any way you like to brew your coffee. Now, each of our coffees carries our brand, the very same brand that we put on our horses, our trailers, and our chaps. So you know that this is a quality product, and we only use 100% Arabica beans, the very best beans available. Just listen to some of these wonderful blends and flavors. Jamaican Me Crazy, Honduran San Marcos, Chocolate Cherry Amaretto, Breakfast Blend, and my very favorite, Haley's Blend. A coffee so good, we named it after my daughter. You can order these coffees today by going online to cowboyentrepreneur.shop. That's cowboyentrepreneur.shop. And if you order today, you can get an extra 10% off your final purchase just by entering the promo code cowboy on checkout remember that's promo code cowboy for an extra 10 percent off just go to cowboyentrepreneur.shop to order your coffee today so how does somebody see the horses like at the auction say if there's somebody in texas that might want to purchase a horse how, can they watch that or do they need to go up there what's the best so we have a faith we have a facebook page so if you type in i'm not very uh computer uh savvy but if you go to facebook and type in uh montana western colt challenge and sale our page will pop up it's not very active right now but we'll get it going um so you can watch the progress of the colt see their papers um they should all be american quarter horse registered um but and then kids will talk about them a little bit here and there we'll have sale videos as we get going our catalog will be online and then we'll we'll have our sale you can be in person and you can bid online too and of course, you know, my number's out there and Robbie and Melanie's and they can call us and ask them. And um, I'm really honest on the Colts. Um, people right. ask, I will tell them exactly what they are. Um, 
especially buying online because I, I want them to know them horses and we're not selling saddle horses we're we're selling colts i always take you know we're gonna have about 80 90 rides on them and they're started by college kids right so right. um but for the most part by sale day you know if there's anything that's that's pretty touchy i don't i don't run through the sale but for the most part um, I feel pretty comfortable with the Colts that we send through, you know, they've been up, they've been trailered. They've had sets of shoes on them. Um, the kids have been, you know, they'll track the hot heels on them. Some will rope live cattle on them, depending on their abilities. Um, so I, I think they have a pretty good foundation um, by the time we come around in April. That's very cool. Man. That's very cool. I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to want to uh, watch that for sure. And probably bid on some. Um, especially yeah, yeah. the facility is incredible. What y'all built there and continue to build is just beautiful, and uh, it's worth the trip, man. I I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, so with with the conference, what was one of your surprises that you maybe thought wasn't going to happen, but you're like after it was over, like that was pretty neat. What was at the conference? Just the 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 global deal. Yeah. You know, I just, and that's always been our vision with William and all that, you know, being from Europe and, you know, he's a citizen of the U.S. too, but bringing in globalness to small town Dillon, Montana, yeah. you know, and offering that to people. And I hope people want to come for that and realize that not just in our community, but throughout the United States, that's what really opened my eyes. And I was glad it was three days because yes. we were kind of talking about that, you know, two days, three days and you know, by that third day, everybody's just, you, you, you know, like you mentioned before we talked here, it, it, maybe you'll be known as, yeah, I was the first conference gathering. I was there. Mm -hmm. You know, I was there for the initial, you know, whatever you want to call it, the first ease or whatever. Right. Um, you know, and I, I kind of afterwards, it's kind of like a three-day horse clinic, too. If, if you do a two-day oh, clinic, it's kind of too short. Third day, you get to know everybody, you're comfortable, and you get to understand people's stories and backgrounds and it didn't matter what your background was. Everybody, you know, just talked about it. It, it was that to me was the neatest thing, the in, international side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody got along and wanted to know about what they're what they did in the industry. And um, I would just kind of eavesdrop a little bit. And I was watching everybody and it was really neat to see um, the camaraderie part. And, uh, yeah, and the emails I still get from it. I mean, I I'm getting emails all the time. Is is it's it's neat. I always yeah. have to say, well, who's this? I don't remember who this person is. I have to ask him who. What was this conversation we had? Very cool. <laughs> but Very the cool. contacts, I think, I think that's really neat. And that's like through our France and our Germany deal. Still, you know, the contacts are still there, and you know, you get text messages, and so hopefully that builds. And I mean, that's our goal you know, the build upon that first. And for our first conference, I think it was a, a huge success. Absolutely. Um, you know, with the, the outcome, you know, the feedback we've had and all that. And I think it's just going to continue to grow. Janet Rose did a really good job. Incredible. Incredible. And William, they were there to help in your team. Everybody was there smiling and working so hard. And they were long days. And everybody was just <laughs> so helpful. For y'all, there was long days. I couldn't imagine, you know, because y'all were working so hard planning it and having a conference. Um, but it never showed, you know, oh, good. The, the work showed, but not the, um, the tiredness or what you put into it, but the whole team yeah. was phenomenal, phenomenal. So it is open to the public so people can buy tickets and, um, you know, and I, I think that's so important. If you want to be a better horse person or, or get at least in the industry, that's a conference, man. That's the one to go to for sure. Yeah. And I think the big thing too, you kind of mentioned it earlier too, is that to me, it's like everybody left their egos at the door. Oh, yes. Yes. There wasn't one person I bumped into that had one. Everybody was there working and um, wanting to be a part of it uh, and appreciate it. It was humble. It was very um, servant leadership like it was it was great. It was so great. Um, and there was a lot of talented people there, too. You know, oh, it, yeah. It was, <laughs> You know, and, and me growing up in the industry, I'm still a uh, student of the industry. I, I want to get better, but I'm in awe of people that, you know, that I don't know something. I want to know. And everybody was just sharing ideas and how they do their events. And that was special. Um, yeah, I mean, I felt like I was just a little fly on the wall, you know, as far <laughs> as what other people brought to the table. But, you know, even, you know, what we present here is different than what a lot of people come from. And so it was just it all intertwined. Absolutely. Very well, very well. Absolutely, it was wonderful. So, what's the plans for the conference next year? I know y'all are 
we're moving some stalls, y'all are adding stalls, you're moving horses over. Um, what's what's next for the for the program? Well, I'll just keep fundraising so we can add on the facilities here. We just got done with our horse pastures. We moved our colt program here. So the whole uh, natural horsemanship program, all of our classes are here at the center now. Um, you know, we're, we're always, Janet's always doing fundraising trips and all that, trying to get people, you know, to know more about MCH and the LaSance method. Um, conference where, you know, we're already trying to schedule people for that, trying to do more horse demonstrations, get people involved, you know, handling horses. Um, that was some of the feedback we had. People wanted more of that. So we're, we're going to try to open doors, getting, you know, do more showing what we do and demonstrations, but then bringing in people that are involved in natural horsemanship and in, in any discipline. So anybody watching, if they're interested, get a hold of us. Um, and then still, still incorporating the film festival. I think that's a huge asset um, globally, and, you know, bringing the international side of things in. Um, yeah, just any, uh, we're open about to anything that, that interests people and improves horsemanship. Yeah. And, and that's a great website too, the Montana center for horsemanship, and you can find a place to donate. And it's, it's just a great program. I, I can't say enough about that. Also with the university of Montana, Western, the block program they have there, that's really a cool deal. Yeah. They're the only public institution that I know of right now. That's maybe changed your last year, but I think we're still the only public institution that does a block schedule for our classes. And what that is, where, why that's a little bit different is these kids will take one class a day for three hours a day for 18 days straight. So they can solely focus on that subject, you know, and that would have fit me really, really good yeah. coming out of high school. Absolutely. I didn't do very good at the first school that I went to. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it so it's crazy. nice. Yeah. It, it's nice, at least with the horse classes, because they're, they're spending every day with that horses and, I mean, we're not riding them hard for three hours. There's a lot of discussion and slow work and all that. Um, but it also gives kids that maybe don't fit the typical take four classes a semester throughout that whole week that would typically probably not succeed at a larger institution. They can come here and, and take those harder classes, but focus on that solely for 18 days. And then they start a new class. So we do, it's four blocks per semester. So eight blocks total. Um, I think it's, just, I kind of forget about the, the typical university setting now, because I just, I've been here for so long now that I just assume it block schedule. How else would you do it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, when I was there, I was getting messages like, where are you? Whenever they saw the campus, it was so beautiful. And then they were asking me about it. And I talked to the chancellor a little bit. Great man. And uh, he was talking about it. And it was, it was, it was really interesting how that works and talking to the kids and, um, we had some parents messages on uh, social media wanting to come up there and, and see the, see the uh, school. And, and that, that was one of the keys. They love the natural horsemanship program and they love the block schedule. And, and uh, yeah, you know, and even our classes, like, you know, we, we have equine science facilities, equine behavior. Um, you know, this, this school Western is very, very good with experiential learning, hands-on experiences. So it's not just the horse classes that they're getting it. They're getting it in other classes they're taking on campus, a lot of field trips, going out to see people in the, in the, in that particular industry and all that. Um, you know, COVID kind of changed some things, but I think we have a great chancellor, um, Michael Reed. I mean, he's all about trying to get it back to what it was before COVID and getting kids interactive. And that was a neat thing with COVID too, you know, really opened my eyes that kids want that hands-on experience. They didn't want to sit home in front of a computer um, on Zoom, unlike what we're doing. Scott, yeah, but. yeah. I would, well, if I could, I would be up there with you for sure. Um, yeah, but, but they know, do, when, when, I think they need it. You know? They do. And, you know, when we, when that first hit that spring, we had to put a couple of our classes on zoom, our horsemanship classes, and it worked, but then there's a few classes like cold starting. How are you going to do that? You had to explain that to the, to the administration. This is a liability and it's dangerous. And, um, but some of our other horsemanship classes we did, um, you know, did videos back and forth. I'd spend all day working on a lesson, editing it, putting, you know, talking over it and all that, and then sending it off to the kid. It, it was a time commitment, but with the horse deal, to me, it, it's never going to change. I mean, I think I think it's a great industry that you still have to have the hands on, and I mm -hmm. I think in today's world, people want that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, they have they need it. 
especially with the horse world. And it's, it's so international now, like, like, the, like the conference that we've been talking about. Um, you know, you're not just learning something going back to the ranch and never leave the ranch. You go all over the world and apply these, the fundamentals of the horseman. Yeah, and Temple Grandin talked about that in both their talks about just getting kids involved as early as possible with skills classes. If it's wood shop, drafting, horses, just getting kids involved nowadays versus just behind their phones. Um, just, you know, a lot of it, you know, uh, you know, with depression being such a big thing now too, you know, getting kids confidence, enjoying things, building stuff with their own hands, a trade. Right. Um, and the horse deal is just, I mean, it's a prime example. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if somebody's listening to this on KCAA and maybe they're not in the horse world or they're watching our podcast thinking, man, I really want to do something like that. How, how, how would you suggest somebody gets involved in our industry? Because if you're not around it, like you did it, you got into the industry and now you're excelling in the industry and now you're going all over the world in the industry. How, what advice would you give someone that's maybe listening or watching for the first time thinking, that's something I want to do. How would you get them to that level? Well, I just didn't want to milk cows. That's that. That was the whole story, Scott. <laughs> so, so everybody should go to a dairy and work a few years in Minnesota. Exactly. And then they'll find their way. <laughs> I hope my dad's not going to watch this, but no. Uh, <laughs> just get involved in anything. I mean, anything, you know, even like a conference, like what we have. Buy a ticket, show up, meet people. Mm -hmm. networking is the big thing you know that that's Absolutely. this is maybe bad to say but i'll i say it in class all the time so i'll just say it but it's not about what you know it, it's about who you know who you meet and 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 i think you have to prove yourself of course work ethic wise you're going to be accountable be there on time but if you, it's not about what you really know if that was the case i would have been sent back to the dairy years ago <laughs> um <laughs> um it's just try to meet people that are in that industry. And I think there's so many avenues, you know, like, like William has over in, in France, they have these uh, mock classes. And I hope I'm saying that right. Cause a lot of their clientele over there can't go to their schools, but they can get involved online and talk about, about the equine industry. If it's, if it's on behavior, if it's, if it's, you know, more science-based, they have professionals go on there and talk just like you're doing Scott. Right. And just watching that and and getting those people's connections and just getting involved and depending on what you want to go into. I mean, to me, probably the riding side of horses is maybe the small part, I guess, nowadays. I agree. Um, I agree. There, there's a big I mean, equine nutrition. I mean, you don't ever probably have to touch a horse to be involved with the horse industry. And right. there's so many good paying jobs, too. You know, that's a big thing I get from parents. You know, what's my son and daughter going to do? Right. Well, first off, I always say go where the work's at, where they, where they want to go. I mean, the work's not around where you want to be, you know, where, where you're at. You got to go, got to be willing to travel. Absolutely. Um, networking. Um, I think that's the huge thing. Just network. I mean, I have connections that I met in the early or late 90s that I ended up full circle around and dealing with some of those people that I met on my internship down o Oklahoma. Wow. Um, so just just get, get involved. I mean, and I think with, with the media nowadays, it, to me is, it should almost be easier. Yeah. I, I think you're um, right. I, I know you're right. I think with all the, the technology, you know, technology is good and bad, but it's good if you want it to be. And I think you can learn a lot, like, you know, going, following y'all and seeing what you're doing up there and, and learning and taking some classes online, but then eventually going there and meeting with people, like you say, is so important and finding a good mentor and people as you network, start talking and asking questions and it, it kind of snowballs and the industry will let you in if you, if you want to, if you seriously want to. Yeah. Don't, don't be the shy. I guess maybe that's the thing too. Don't be shy. That's awesome. Um, that's right. When I, when I left home, I was a pretty shy kid. I mean, I would, if you would have told me what I'm doing now, I would have said there is no way that would be happening. I mean, I was a shy little kid, but the best thing I probably did was move, you know, 12 hours away from home. And that was before cell phones. So if you needed something, you're on your own. Yeah, right. right. Um, you had to meet people and talk to people. And, and I think that's a lot of it. You know, six, I have two really good friends of mine and they're very successful in their businesses, but what makes them successful is they're, they're just good with people. They're talking and 
you know, and they're, they're not afraid to say what's on their mind or, or hurt people's feelings, but they're, they're honest about things. Right. And you, you gotta maybe have a little bit of thick skin, but to me, you gotta learn from people being honest, telling you, you know, advice Absolutely. and all that and don't take it personal. Absolutely. Cause it's going to help you for sure. And, and big things don't have someone tell you, you can't do it. I mean, if that was the deal. I would have, yeah. I mean, I would have never Great got a horse at 15. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's, that's such a, 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 a statement, but it's a powerful statement because if you want to, you can succeed in this industry in one way that there's too many things not to, there's too many ways not to. There's like yeah, I, I have students, parents that, you know, they, they kind of similar to my deal, you know, parents don't understand exactly. They're not involved in the horse industry. They don't understand why their son or daughter wants to do this. And my parents were the same way. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I know my dad had my dad and mom both had gray hair wondering where I was at in the West what I was doing, how much I was making. Um, I know my mom had a separate address book. She had an address book and then she had Eric's address book. <laughs> and it was probably just as full because every time I talked to her, I was somewhere else, you know, riding with somebody or just yeah. traveling. And, um, you know, I, I know that every time I would go home, which wasn't very often, they like, what are you doing? When are you going to get real about your life? And it probably wasn't up until um, my mom passed away. So, I mean, she kind of, didn't see where I was going fully where I am now. But when I started, I know it was my dad, not too long ago, maybe 10 years ago. I was like, I, I understand now. That's, I kind of understand what you want to do. How beautiful, man. That's awesome. So, and that's coming from a man that wouldn't say too much. The only time he talked is if you were doing something wrong. <laughs> um, so that, that was kind of our heart to heart, I guess, yeah. moment. It wasn't a good job deal. It just, I understand so that that meant the world to me when he Absolutely. said that. Um, absolutely and it's and you can't go even if it's not the equine industry you can't go into it worrying about money i mean yeah you need money to live i guess wow. but it it'll, it'll pay off in the long run you stick with it long enough you'll start getting paid and um but you, you can't take money with you when you die anyway so you might as well no. enjoy life a absolutely absolutely and what you get to do in the school gets to do it's so special you know because you're given generational gifts you know, and that's, that's a special deal for sure. For sure. So, so you want to tell us about what you have over your right shoulder there? That's a beautiful um, <laughs> sculpture. So William Kriegel, he's, he's the owner of LaSance Montana Ranch south of town here. And we've had some transitions here and he had some bronzes and he's also the president of the, on the board for the Montana Center for Horsemanship also with some uh, local businessmen here. Um, but he wanted these sculptures to take from Lasans to over here. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, a Charlie Russell bronze wow. sculpture. Wow. It's beautiful. So it beautiful. Um, yeah, that, that will stay here as, as long as I'm here and hopefully pass, pass <laughs> my time. It's, it's a unique deal. And that's yeah, um, a cool deal, man. Very cool. I guess a person gets older, you appreciate things, you know, things like that, just momental stuff from the history. Yeah. And like I said, I've known William for, I mean, I worked for him in 02, but I really got to know him here the last 13 years. So it, it's kind of a one of my cherished things, I guess, that, you know, that we just got here. Absolutely. I didn't even know that was a talking piece, Scott, until you mentioned something. Man, I just it put is, it, man. Put it that, that's Charlie Russell. Yeah. That's, Charlie Russell's a big deal, man. And that's a beautiful piece, <laughs> for sure. That's really cool. Yeah, man, especially, with, especially with Montana and the history of Charlie Russell and all that. Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Craig, he worked so hard during that event. Every time I saw him, he was moving chairs or taking water bottles and Janet was running around and and uh, it was really cool to see. It was just great. I, I have learned. I have learned so much from William. I mean, he, he's an entrepreneur in business and all that internationally. And, you know, most people, when you get done with like the conference like that, you're like, oh, we're done. He's we're having meetings on that last day. Hey, what are we going to do different next year? Already? You know, he's always <laughs> always building it and i i appreciate that you know it's you can always make it better and you know if it's just yourself or you know what can you always do better not always just settling for yeah it was good no what can we do better for next year let's get on it now um so that's where we've been having meetings for the, for the next conference so there has been no no downtime for that no, so but but no. it's good if you want a high quality you know conference or business you you got to do that how can you always improve yourself and that, that that's really stuck with me that he's taught me as far as even business stuff he, he has shown me and just attitude's the big thing absolutely 
That's very cool. So what do you do in your downtime? I know you don't have a lot of it. Is there a hobby or something you do uh, when you're not riding or teaching? Yeah, I kind of got into the, the hound hunting a little bit. Have you? Um, yeah, I mean, of course, I have, you know, a wife and two kids. So you guys, I mean, anybody with kids knows that's that's kind of your job. You can't Understood. be too, too selfish about stuff. So it's all about the kids now. But uh, no, when I get time, I got I got a set of dogs I hunt lions with and um, chase some bears around and all that. And so it's but it, it's really turned into how similar it is with the horses. Um, I know those first years, you know, I kind of same thing, you know. How do you get involved with that? I got a dog and didn't know what I was doing with it. And looking back on it, I was just kind of getting in the way of it. It was bred for. I just needed to leave it alone, but you wanted to help it so much and yeah. correlates to the horses a lot. But then I just started calling people and asking them. And some people would hang up on you. And some people, <laughs> I have a really good friend and I have a really good friend in Idaho. I mean, he's, he's pretty known for the blue tick deal and I, you know, I haven't talked to him in a couple of weeks, but I, yeah, the, usually when we're hunting, I call him every week, picking his mind and any chance he invites me to go with, even if I don't take dogs just to go with him and um, just same deal with network, you know, don't be afraid to just pick up the phone and call somebody. Worst thing they're going to do is hang up on you. Call them yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wear them out. Wear them out. I thought for sure you're going to say go to Minnesota and milk cows. Um, but you didn't. No, no. Nope. <laughs> dad, dad sold the dairy after 50 years of milk, and he got rid of those cows. And he still farms. I, Does I he? wish I was there right now, help because I haven't got really any spring planting or harvest deal. It'd be nice to do. He's 77 years old, and it'd be nice to do that one more time with him. But it's Absolutely. just it's a tough time of year for for what I do. Yeah, it's, you're so busy. You're so busy. And so uh, I guess last question. So, so what's next for the students? So if there's a student that wants to come up there or they're following online or the parents see the show or hear the show, how can they research to start getting their kids involved to come up there for school? So I would go to our department page. So if you, if you Google uh, University of Montana Western, get on their website then go underneath academics and you'll find our department page underneath equine studies. That'll get you our contact information. There's some videos on there, our online application too, which we're already getting applications in for fall of 2022. Awesome. Um, we're pretty limited on the amount of kids we can get, but then you can call, you can call me. I'll just give you my number right now. It's 406-925-1499. Awesome. Um, my email is on there too. I mean, I'm, that's usually what I do in the mornings is answer emails on questions and all that. Um, but then if you're really wanting to kind of commit and come up and see the school and see our program, you can call our admissions department and set up a campus tour. And then they usually let us know when we have a kid that's coming up for a tour for the equine program and they'll meet with one of us and we'll show the facilities and all that. So pretty simple deal. Just kind of get up on our page and research a little bit and get a hold of us. Sounds wonderful, man. Thank you so much for being on the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, Eric. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me to come up to the conference. I loved meeting everyone up there. And, and uh, I talk about that conference so much, just all the great people, plus the knowledge and the horses. But the people really stood out. It was wonderful. No, same, same here, Scott. Anytime, even if it's not a conference, you're kind of passing through, just stop on in. We sure will, man. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone that's listened to our show on KCAA out in California on the NBC affiliate and also watching our podcast, the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show on all of our platforms. Thank you so much for watching and listening with Eric Hoffman. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you to all the great sponsors of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. For more information about today's guest, Eric Hoffman, please go online to montanacenterforhorsemanship.org. If you or your business is interested in being a sponsor of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, please call our office at 830-992-1786 or visit our website, cowboyentrepreneur.com.